Prime Minister, we've heard yeah. from the opposition calls for your resignation. Right. It has also been suggested that your series of town hall meetings and with this market steps meeting plan for Thursday are basically attempts to feel the pulse of the public because you are considering an early general election. What is your response? Pete, let me put it this way. I can understand the anxiety of Michael Chastney and his son to get their hands on the levers of government. But Alan Chastney should be the last person in the world to issue any invitation to me to resign. Let's face the facts. Alan Chastney could not win a seat in Sufra. He was soundly defeated in Sufra by Harald Dalsam. But what is worse is that it looks like he wants to take St. Lucia through another trauma, like the one he took the country through when he was Minister of Tourism. Everybody remembers the fiasco of boxing in paradise. We all remember the HEPO issue. Then all the evidence indicates that the catastrophes we had in respect to the Daher Mall, as well as the loss of hundreds of acres of land in Black Bay, in the south of the island, were in fact caused by decisions involving Alan Chastney. He was at the center of the losses that the government and people of St. Lucia incurred because he was part of that decision-making process, and he encouraged the investments in both of these things. What therefore he wants to lead this country through, to take this country through another bout of, of trauma. To this day, the governments of the Eastern Caribbean remember his behavior over the Suriname Airways matter. The embarrassment that he caused not only to sit in Prime Minister King, but also to the governments of Antigua and, and St. Vincent. I think this country has to be protected from Alan Chastney and his father. And very clearly, it will be for the people of this country to decide at the right time whether they feel they can trust these two to manage the affairs of the country. It's not just about the UWP. It is really about Alan Chastney and his father. Both of them seem to be promoting the same agenda at the same time. But are you considering early elections? I not at not all. Attend. Not at all. You made reference to the public meetings and the town halls. The government has stated very clearly that we are taking an unprecedented step. The people of St. Lucia have never, ever gone through the trauma of adjustment as we have to take them through. It's been the most difficult decision we have had to make since independence. And in that kind of situation, we really need to tell our side of the story to the people of St. Lucia. That is why we have held town hall meetings in and around the country. Uh, we have met interest groups, we have met civil society groups, we have met nice workers simply to tell them what the issues are and how we see the issues being resolved. I don't know why a public meeting of the St. Lucia Labour Party should arouse so much interest. After all, this is midterm, and we are a party with a great oral tradition. We enjoy public meetings, and it's about time that we begin to turn up the heat. After all, we've been rather silent, haven't we? Um, we have allowed all and sundry to say everything. We have not engaged our people. We have engaged them by other means, largely through town hall meetings. So. It's time to, let, to engage in the theater of the market steps, in the theater of the public meetings. And so on Thursday night, that's exactly what we'll be doing, Pete. Your colleague, um, Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Basesa, mm -hmm. and I understand you're a student as well, a former student. Former of yours, student, yes. Former student of yours, <laughs> yeah. has, um, mm -hmm. has basically raised the possibility of term limits for heads of government, and interestingly, the possibility of um, voters actually recalling candidates by some kinds of kind of process mm -hmm. if they're not satisfied with them. What what do you think of this rather interesting well, proposal? I, I think she's speaking um, specifically to the domestic situation in Trinidad and Tobago 
um, both her government as well as the predecessor government under Manning went through some very difficult constitutional and political issues. And uh, constitutional reform has been on the agenda in Trinidad and Tobago for some time. But you know, we have the report of our constitutional commission and they address those issues. The issues she has raised are not new issues. I mean, these are issues that have been championed throughout the Caribbean. In fact, um, you may recall the very first manifesto of the St. Lucia Labour Party. We had, in fact, introduced legislation or drafted legislation to have term limits for um, parliamentarians who, of course, did not um, satisfy their constituents, who did not please their constituents, or who, obviously, um, created problems for their constituents. But of course, we did not complete that process, that constitutional process. But these issues are issues that have been championed in the report of the Constitution Review Commission, which, by the way, of course, we need to debate in Parliament, and which we need to set a new date because of the delay of the budget procedures this year. So what the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago has raised are not new issues. They've been championed throughout the length and breadth of the Caribbean, and I'll put it to you that nearly every report of every constitution commission in the Caribbean make reference to these issues. Nothing new. What is your own position? On these matters? Yes. Term limits, I have no difficulty with term li limits for parliamentarians if they commit very serious infractions. I also believe that where a parliamentarian crosses the floor, that is to say to move from one political party to the next political party, they ought to resign for the very simple reason that people were persuaded to vote for them on the basis of loyalty to a particular um, political party. That parliamentarians are not elected in their own right. Parliamentarians are elected because they are representatives of political parties. I mean, you look at the history of someone who was departed a long time ago, George Odlum. George Odlum never ever won a seat on his own accord. He only won um, a seat to represent people when he was a candidate of the St. Lucia Labour Party. That's what the history will tell you. So it's very clear that um, whether you are a parliamentarian or not depends heavily on whether the political party that you represent um, presented you to the electorate, and this electorate supported you on that, that basis. As for term mm -hmm. limits for leaders, mm -hmm. I believe that's a matter for people to determine. I share the view which says that the people of the country decide whether they're tired of you or not. Prime Minister, finally, on sure. the matter of the police. Now, it is true that um, more police officers isn't the answer to, 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 yeah. to crime. But at, at this point, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force is... Um, afflicted by a problem of attrition, resignations, mm. and so on, that is diminishing the human resource potential of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. Mm. What is being done to address that, or what realistically can be done within the economic constraints mm. currently facing the country? Okay. The Governor St. Lucia is always sensitive to the needs of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. I mean, and we have to remain so because of the ongoing fight against crime. But I think you hit the nail on the head. Having additional police officers is not the solution to crime. Um, we have to look at other things. I mean, the very management of the police itself, the deployment of the police. We have to consider our ability to um, to resolve crime, our ability to to investigate and to convict, and we have to also to look at the performance of our judicial system, how quickly people are brought to justice and how quickly a determination is made of whether they are guilty or not guilty. These are issues that you have to consider, and you can't look at things in isolation. The second thing is this. Um, there are people who will argue that the ratio of police officers to citizens is very high in St. Lucia, meaning that we have a high number of police officers relative to the population that we have. And other countries with less crimes do not have as high a ratio as we have. So, I mean, there's that kind of argument. But yes, um, the police is one professional arm of the state where officers come and go. Some officers get attracted to go to other jurisdictions. Bermuda, for example, where the salaries are much better. Um, that happens, and then it's it's a professional arm of the state where there is high mobility. Some officers retire and get involved in providing private security of one kind or another. But the government will always be sensitive to, to police officers, but I don't think that there is necessarily a relationship between um, um, the ability to fight crime and a high number of, of police officers. I think there are other issues at stake that we have to consider at, at all times. 
but clearly um, we can't allow attrition to continue in perpetuity. And at the right time, we clearly would have to look at numbers to see whether there's a basis or justification for additional training of police officers, because you recall only, um, I think it was in 2012, 2000, 2011, 2012, we had a cohort of police officers who were trained. We have a number of SPCs, for example, who were trained to undertake security services for judicial personnel. Some of them have not been employed. So there's a kind of a pool that, that is available. but. In the situation we are in, we have to keep an eye on expenditure very closely, as you know, um, because of the um, financial stresses that we are undergoing. So these are issues that we have to, to look at. Finally, let me just say this. One of the problems that we are experiencing with the police force is a high amount of leave that is available to individual officers because given the shortages of the past and the challenges of the past, the police responded by cancelling the leave of officers. And this is a huge problem. And I know the Commission is working very hard to try to encourage police officers to take their leave. When that happens, with the frequency does it does, it means therefore that the number of men available for de deployment is also reduced. So it's a combination of factors and we will remain exceedingly sensitive to the, to, to the needs of the, of the police. But of course, this is an environment in which we have to make very careful decisions. Prime Minister, thank you very much. What a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.